And the talk is being given by Jan. Jan Shaw. Right. All right. All right. Hi, my name is Jan Shaw. And today I'll be talking about joint work with my advisor, Roman Vashinen, who is not here at the moment. So as you can see from the title of the talk, the focus is going to be on this problem called long Gaussian component analysis. But since I assume that most people in this audience have no idea what this problem is, I'm going to start by talking about the more, related, the more familiar problem of independent component analysis. So what's ICA? ICA is motivated by plant source separation, which is a problem that we faced during the poster session. So in the poster session, we're trying to listen to the poster presenter, but there are 100 other people who are talking at the same time. So we can't hear what they say, so we need to do some sort of separation. <clears throat> so more concretely, you have two, two speakers, Alice and Bob, and you have two sensors, and the two people are talking at the same time, and each of the sensors receives a linear combination of the, two so the sound waves that come from the two people. If you want to hear what Alice says or you want to hear what Bob says, you have to invert this linear transformation in order to recover S1 or S2. All right, so here's the model more formally. So you have a signal vector S where the components S1 to Sn are independent and non-Gaussian. We have an n by n mixing matrix A and a Gaussian noise vector G. And what we observe are independent copies X1 to X, Xn of our random vector x, which is defined by as plus g. And from these independent copies, you want to learn the mixing matrix A. So that's the goal of ICA. OK, so that's the model for ICA. How can we try to solve this problem? One idea is to use cumulants. So what are cumulants? So given the random variable x, the first three cumulants are defined as follows. So the first cumulant is the mean, the second cumulant is the variance, the third cumulant has this strange expression. And for, you can actually define cumulants of order m for every positive integer m. And as you can imagine, if you follow this trend, as m becomes bigger and bigger, you get, you're going to get more and more complicated expressions. OK, so why are we interested in these objects? Well, because they have several nice properties. The first property is that they are additive over independent random variables. So if x and y are independent, then for any m, the m cumulant of the, of the sum is the sum of the m cumulants. So that's the first property. The second property is that cumulants characterize Gaussians. So if you have a Gaussian, so it doesn't matter what mean and what variance, then its m cumulant for any m bigger than or equal to 3 is going to be equal to 0. So this characterizes Gaussians. All right, so so far, I've defined cumulants for random variables. You can equally define them for random vectors. However, because random vectors are multi-dimensional objects, cumulants are going to become tensors. Here is the key lemma that is used for, IC for analyzing ICA algorithms. OK, so here's the lemma. So I let Km denote the nth cumulant tensor of x, and I let the Ais denote the columns of the mixing matrix. All right, so with this notation, I can write Km as the sum of n terms, and each term is the nth outer product of the Ai multiplied by the nth cumulant of Si. Okay, so what is important to notice over here is that we can actually write Km as a low rank tensor decomposition. And in fact, if we assume that A is orthogonal, so this is very easy, you can always just write it to assume that A is orthogonal. And we further assume that for some m, all the nth cumulants of the SIs are non-zero. Then, in this case, the AIs are precisely the tensor eigenvectors of Km. Okay, so tensor eigenvectors are nice because they behave very similar to matrix eigenvectors. Okay, so we can use this, this property to produce algorithms that are provable. Okay, so here are some provable algorithms. Okay, so here, first, here are some algorithms that explicitly use Km. So here's the first one. The first one is a power method. And uh, the point is to realize that the tensor eigenvectors are the attracting fixed points of this power iteration map. So by running this power iteration, you're going to end up at one of these eigenvectors. And then you just repeat it, repeat the process. So here's another algorithm. 
And the idea is to do local search using gradient and Hessian information. And here we're using gradient Hessian information of this function f of z, which is defined by plugging in the variable z into all the components of the tensor. Okay, so over here, we're making use of the property that the tensor eigenvectors are the local optima of this function. And then we also have algorithms that implicitly, implicitly use cumulants. All right, so here's an algorithm by Goyev and Palacio, and the idea is to make use of the cumulant generating function. You see gf, which is defined by the log of the characteristic function. Okay, so for finite samples, this algorithm turns out to be simply reweighted PCA. And so you, you sum up the outer products of the observed random ve vectors xi, and you multiply each of these terms with a weight. And for this algorithm, we use Fourier weights. All right, so that was for ICA. So let's move on to NGCA. So I'm going to start with the model for ICA, and then let's see how it changes when we move on to non-Gaussian component analysis. Okay, so first our set, uh, a signal vector S. Okay, so we no longer we drop this assumption that the components are independent. So we still want to have the entire vector be non-Gaussian. And then our matrix A is no longer n by n, and it's now d by n. Okay, so A is no longer really a mixing matrix, it is an embedding matrix. It embeds S into the, the vector space Rn. And we continue to observe independent copies, but the goal is different. The goal is now simply to learn the range of the mixing matrix A. Okay, so the range of A uh, can also be seen as the non-Gaussian subspace of the random vector X. Okay, so what's the motivation? So even though IC and NGCA have very similar models, the motivation is very different. So in NGCA, right, we can imagine the point cloud. So you have some point cloud in some high dimensional space, and the points have some structure in a low dimensional subspace. However, this distribution is corrupted by large uh, noise of large variance in all the orthogonal directions. So if you try to run PCA, this is going to fail, but we can use distribution assumptions on the data in order to find this projection to the good structured subspace. All right, so here's the key ICA lemma again. So unfortunately, it no longer holds for NGCA. Okay, so the formula disappears, you still have some formula, but we lose this low rank decomposition. Okay, so we lose the crucial low rank decomposition, which means that maybe some of the algorithms are no longer, no longer going to work anymore. All right, so we can still ask whether the algorithms can be adapted. So first, we have to realize that we need new assumptions. So for ICA, we assume that the, ICA, the SIs have non-zero m cumulants, but now we lose the privileged directions. We no longer have these n privileged directions, so we instead have to assume that all the marginals have non-zero n cumulants. Okay, so with the, even with this assumption, the power method fails because we no longer have this low rank structure. We can still do local search, we can adapt this algorithm. However, there are some drawbacks. We can ask the question whether the third algorithm for real PCA can be adapted. Okay, so the naive adaptation doesn't work, but we can actually change the weights to get something that does work. All right, so here's the algorithm. Okay, so we, considered it, we first considered the following two test matrices. So here we have the covariance of x, except that we modulate the distribution by multiplying it by this quantity e to the minus alpha times norm of x squared. And then our second matrix is a bit more complicated. We take x and an independent copy x prime, we form the outer product, and again, we modulate the distribution with this quantity, e to the minus alpha, x dot x prime. Okay, and we have some normalizing quantities. So we consider these two test matrices. We form the eigenvalue decomposition, and then we output the eigenvectors that correspond to the outlier eigenvalues. So these eigenvectors are going to end up as lying inside the non-Gaussian subspace, and if we have found all the directions in one step, we are happy and we're we done, but we, if we haven't done so, we have to project onto the orthogonal complement and then iterate this algorithm. Okay, so here's our theorem. So the theorem says that this algorithm works and polynomial time is sample complexity so long as the dimension is constant. Okay, and here's some ingredients of the proof that I'm not going to go into. Thank you. Okay, we can take one quick question if there's a burning one.
No questions? All right. Well, that, that brings us to the conclusion of this session. Um, so next up is the poster session outside. And then I hope you'll all join us for dinner at the Archipelago. Um, let's thank once again Yan Xiu and all the speakers of this session. Thank you.